My name is Father Philip Smith of the Kent Estuary Catholic Churches in the southern part of Cumbria. I'm going to give a homily on the uh, Advent, second Sunday of Advent uh, in year C of the Catholic cycle. And I leave you, as always, to uh, read the readings. But just a, li a little preface beforehand. The whole purpose of Advent is, Advent means coming, the coming of the Lord at Christmas and in other ways, in judgment and daily into our hearts, three comings of our Lord. And uh, the whole point of this time of preparation is to learn more fully how to welcome the coming of the Lord. And, and this is our great exercise, spiritual exercise during this time of Advent. The readings, uh, first of all, from the prophet Baruch, uh, and it's about the returning exiles who returned to Jerusalem, uh, and their sorrow and distress is to be forgotten, they're to have peace. Jerusalem is to rise up again, uh, seeing your sons reassemble from east and west and come towards you to give you new life after being deserted. And uh, it reads near the end, God has decreed an easy way in to Jerusalem, flattening of high mountains, filling of valleys and so on, flattening out the road into Jerusalem. That's going to come up in the Gospel reading. God will guide us, or these people coming home by the light of his glory. And then the psalm echoes that, uh, that it was the psalm of the exiles in Babylon. When the Lord delivered Zion from bondage in Babylon, it seemed like a dream. It goes on, deliver us, O Lord, from our bondage. A great song of thankfulness that they're freed from their bondage or enslavement and are free to go home to rebuild Jerusalem. The second reading is a letter of St Paul to the Philippians and God prays for his uh, <coughs> new converts in Philippi. They're very enthusiastic, but they're sometimes a bit wobbly in their faith and they tend to go off, so they need a lot of oversight and praise and encouragement. But um, he prays that uh, they'll love each other more and more and they'll never stop improving their knowledge of God, of course, and his ways and deepening their perception so that they can always recognise what is best what is God's way? And uh, we go on then to the Gospel, and it's about uh, the beginning of the Gospel uh, of Luke, pretty near the beginning, um, about, well, first of all, it gives a whole lot of dates and people's names, so it, Luke is emphasising that we have a historical religion that's anchored in time and space. It's not a made-up thing. It's not a fiction. We can't fiddle around with it. It's given to us. In the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor, and so on and so forth. It tells of the coming of John. Again, John the Baptist. A historical figure, well known in the time. And he gives a baptism of repentance. We'll have to come to the word repentance. And he repeats, um, prepare a way for the Lord, make his path straight. Remember the prophet Baruch in the first reading. Uh, make the rough road smooth and all mankind shall see the salvation of God. I leave those readings to you. You may get something out of them that I haven't seen. Quite possible because uh, the Lord may point out something to you personally. This is very meaningful. 
Our scriptures, even though they're written a long time ago, remember, are spirit-filled, if read in the right way, and therefore they're ever fresh and new, speaking to our hearts. Anyway, just to go on with the my thoughts, John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance. He's to prepare people's hearts to receive the teaching of Jesus by making paths straight into their hearts. Prepare a way for the Lord, make his path straight into my heart. That's the principle. So what exactly is this repentance and why do I need it? Well, repentance is a change of heart, an opening up. It's turning away from any conduct that allows my will or my obsessions and fears and so on and so forth to be the controlling force in my life and allows God to be my guiding light. Remember the first reading, God will guide you with his light and his grace, allow his grace into my life. These blocks that we put up to God, I do emphasize, may not be wholly our fault, but they do block out God's graces from being fully effective in our lives. A soul that is completely cut off from God and his graces is like a house during an electrical power cut. This is very topical in Grange over Sands, where last week we had three days without electricity. Um, without power, a house will soon be turned into a rather miserable, cold, unwelcoming and dark place. A soul that has God and his graces in possession is, by contrast, like a house that is comfortable, secure, warm and welcoming. Now, repentance, in a, an ordinary sense, is common in our lives, because we often put our own will first in front of good advice. For example, a doctor or a healthcare person uh, gives us some sound advice, but we go away and ignore it, but it's for our health. Um, then perhaps we think the better of it. We repent of our pig-headedness that blocks out this help, this good advice. To give an example, uh, I was told recently to take care of my eyes. I was to do some very simple treatments for the good of my eyes. I put off doing this until recently I decided to follow that good advice. I've repented of my stubbornness. Repentance. So that's an idea of what repentance is. But we have also to repent of those things that prevent God entering our lives more fully. When we do this, we prepare a way for the Lord and make his path straight into our hearts, as John the Baptist says. Now, uh, we have to repent particularly of those things that hold us in bondage or slavery of mind, body and heart, and therefore shut out the graces of God and his influence. The psalm says, deliver us, O Lord, from our bondage. Now, these bondages keep us from wholeheartedly opening to God. Only when we repent of these things, that is, turn around and put God in the centre of our lives, can the Lord deliver us from the bondages? A person may be bound by some habitual sin, for example, that keeps them from allowing God in. They have a bad conscience. So, if that is so, repent of it. Go to confession and feel the rush of joy and of peace that comes into a soul that has had its sins washed away in sacramental confession. You know, witnessing to the loving mercy of God transform a soul is one of the highest points in the life of every priest. It's a joy. 
Do you use the sacrament? Maturely. It's the most intimate, personal meeting with a loving and merciful God. But let's go further. We may hardly, uh, there may be also other things that hold us in bondage. Some habits of life that control us. We may hardly recognise them as controlling forces. They're so much part of our lives. We may not be responsible for them controlling our lives. These also prevent us opening to God and receiving his great gifts of joy and hope. Here are some examples that spring to mind. Busyness. Busyness blocks out God. And eventually uh, God appears unimportant, irrelevant. As people pursue their obsession with busyness. They're in bondage. Timidity. A timid or anxious person may become so wrapped up in their worries that these worries take over control, block out God. Again, bondage. And bad experiences. That's a very difficult one. Another may, because of bad experiences, distrust God and his church. Now, God understands their struggle. But nevertheless, they too must ask in whatever way they can to be released from this bondage, this resistance that blocks out their openness to God and his graces. The difficulty is with such people, their moral blame is quite a different thing. Probably they're not to blame. (coughs) Such people cannot open their hearts to God while in that state of slavery to other things. We cannot learn the length, the width, the depth and the heights of God's love for us when we're closed up like a clamshell. We cannot, as St Paul says, improve our knowledge of God or deepen our perception to recognise what is the best way, the God way forward. Now, holding to a bondage way of life is a very false security. It's rather like uh, refusing to take to the lifeboats from a sinking ship and preferring to stand on the deck of the sinking ship, feeling that that's more secure. It's an illusion of false security. To base our lives on passing material ways of life, for example. And it prevents us from seeking the real security of life with God. (coughs) Our prayer might be something like this. In response to the uh, words of scripture. Loving and merciful God, come into my life more fully. Pour into my heart your graces. Free me from the bondage of bad habits, willfulness, anxieties that control my life and divide me from you. Open my heart anew to repent so that I may with joy receive you in a heartfelt way this Christmas. Make me a true channel of your peace and love for the benefit of myself and for others who will receive of that love and peace through me. Amen. And now a word about streaming. I think the streaming at last has settled down. It was complicated. So masses are not now uh, normally recorded unless I state otherwise or other services. They're streamed in real time at the times mentioned in the newsletter, normally at 10 o'clock mass each day of the week, Monday to Saturday. Uh, It can be at Christ the King, can be at St. Charles, 10 o'clock. And Sunday masses streamed, 9 o'clock St. Charles on Sunday, 10.30 Christ the King. 
Equally, other things will come up. For example, at St. Charles, there is a regular uh, office of the church, 10 o'clock Thursday, 10 o'clock Friday, followed on Thursday by the rosary, and on Friday by a time of adoration. There may be other th things as advertised. I do ask you to join them. Equally, uh, some people have found comfort in turning on the streaming late at night. You can't see very much, it's all very grey, but there's the slightly moving light of the tabernacle light just next to the tabernacle. People find it comforting to know the presence of the Lord just before they go to sleep, go to bed. Perhaps there'll be many other occasions when we have streamed on Sunday afternoon, for example, from Christ the King, in the afternoon at a uh, uh, I beg your pardon, it's either 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon. We have um, uh, churches together, Advent uh, liturgy, preparation with hymns. Very simple. At Christ the King. That'll be streamed. I hope that introduces you to what might happen, the possibilities of streaming. I had to stop the recording because it was taking so much of my time, personally. It was detracting, taking me away from necessary pastoral work. So God bless you and keep you. Mm -hmm.